Hi there, I'm Lou. And I'm Lee. And this is Uncovering History. And welcome to our fourth episode of Uncovering History. Today we're going to be looking at the history of Henry VIII. And like I said in the last podcast, the Tudor period is really, really fascinating and one of my favourite um, periods of history. So I'm going to start off with a brief overview just to ease you in gently, Lee. Okay. Um, so Henry VIII, he was born in 1491 and died in 1547. He ruled England for 36 years, presiding over sweeping changes that brought his nation into the Protestant Reformation. He famously married a series of six wives, which we will go into a lot more detail in a little bit, um, in a search for political alliance, marital bliss and a healthy male heir. His desire to annul his first marriage without papal approval led to the creation of the separate Church of England. Of his marriage, two ended in annulment, two in natural deaths, and two with his wife's beheadings for adultery and treason. His children, Edward VI, Mary I, and Elizabeth I, would each take their turn as England's monarchs. So, we're going to start off with Henry's early life. So, Henry was born on June the 28th, 1491. He was the second son of Henry VII, the first English ruler from the House of Tudor. So, while his older brother Arthur was being prepared for the throne, Henry was steered towards a church career with a broad education in theology, music, languages, poetry and sports. So what was really interesting when I was doing my research is because Henry was the spare, so you've heard of that term, the heir and the spare, Mm -hmm. because he was the spare, um, there's very little documentation about his early life because I guess nobody really, it's not that they didn't care about him, but his kind of legacy wasn't important. Well, he wasn't meant to be king, was he? So I guess you document the future king's life from the day of their birth. But if someone is just going to be, as you say, the spare, then you take less sort of interest. Absolutely. And his his kind of early childhood was was more liberal than you would say his brother, Arthur, who was obviously kind of, you know, groomed to be king. Mm. So there's very little known, like I've said. And actually, it's quite interesting that maybe this kind of liberal childhood that he kind of enjoyed followed him in to his reign. So Henry was born on June 28th, like we said, and he was the second son. Um, And Arthur had been betrothed since the age of two to Catherine of Aragon. And she was the daughter of Spanish rulers Ferdinand and Isabella. And in November of 1501, the teenage couple were married. Months later, however, Arthur died all of a sudden of um, a strange illness and Henry became next in line for the throne and in 1503 was betrothed to his brother's widow. Interesting. Yeah, exactly. I mean, it's a bit odd, isn't it? You would, I mean, in today's age, you wouldn't really think, right, okay, well, my brother or sister's just died. I'm going to marry their their wife or spouse. Well, that's the thing, like, because obviously we were taught this in school and you always hear of her being his wife. You never hear of her being his brother's wife and then his wife. So it's it's, it's interesting. It's really odd as well. And also there's there's this big argument that, you know, everyone knows that Henry obviously had so many wives and in order for him to kind of break away from Catherine of Aragon, he had to try and prove to the Pope um, that their marriage was never really, um, you know, proper. Mm. It was something that was against God. Um, And he spent years and years and years trying to prove this. Anyway, we're going to look at his first years as king. So Henry VIII took the throne at the age of 17. Can you imagine being a king or a queen at 17 years old? I was like a year off going to university. I would not be ready for that. <laughs> well, I mean, what what would I do? What would your priorities be? <laughs> booze, booze, booze. <laughs> and extended late nights. Parties. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's essentially that. So anyway, at the age of 17, he married Catherine of Aragon six weeks later. So over the next 15 years, while Henry fought three wars with France, Catherine bore him three sons and three daughters, all but one 
um, of whom died in infancy. So the sole survivor was Mary, and she became later Mary I, and she was born in 1516. So Henry was an active king in those years, keeping a festive court, hunting, jousting, writing and playing music. He issued a book-length attack on Martin Luther's church reforms that earned him the title Defender of the Faith from Pope Leo X. But the lack of a male heir, especially after he fathered a healthy, illegitimate son, Henry Fitzroy, in 1519, gnawed at the king. So we're going to spend a bit of time really looking at one of Henry's most famous parts of history, his marriages. Mm -hmm. Okay. So do you know who the first queen was? I've already told you. Well, it's Aragon, isn't it? It is Aragon. Yeah, absolutely. So who was Catherine of Aragon? So Catherine of Aragon, like we said, was the daughter of Spanish monarchs King Ferdinand II and Queen Isabella. She married Henry VIII, but did not give birth to a male heir. Catherine refused to annul her marriage so that Henry could marry again, which led to the separation of the Church of England from the Catholic Church. Catherine died in England in 1536. Her only surviving child, Mary Tudor, became queen in 1553. So let's have a look at her early life. So she was born on December the 16th, 1485, in Alcala de Jaranes, near uh, Madrid. She was the youngest daughter of the monarchs who had united the country, King Ferdinand II of Aragon and Queen Isabella of Castile. So growing up, Catherine received a thorough education that included Latin, French and philosophy, along with pursuits like embroidery. So having been engaged to Prince Arthur, heir to the English throne since childhood, Catherine went to England and married him in 1501. Following Arthur's untimely death in 1502, Catherine was betrothed to Henry, Arthur's brother. Now, when Arthur actually died, um, I think I read somewhere that the people of England were actually quite concerned that it would be Henry who would take the throne because Arthur was this kind of strapping young lad, um, kingly in his ways. He had been kind of, you know, groomed, like I said, to be king. And they were left with this sort of, you know, unknown male heir who would eventually take over you know the kingdom yeah because i guess like you said he was kind of unknown he wasn't in the spotlight so the public are naturally going to be sort of fearful of such an event exactly so the dispensation needed for a man to marry his brother's widow was granted by the catholic church but the marriage was delayed due to henry's young age as well as clashes between england and spain about the payment of catherine's dowry she finally wed henry in 1509 after he had taken the throne to become henry the eighth so they married after he had basically become king hmm. So Catherine and Henry had a comfortable marriage for years. So with the popular Catherine even serving as regent and overseeing a battle with the Scots while Henry was waging war in France. Though she gave birth to six children, including one surviving daughter, Mary Tudor, Catherine did not produce a male heir for Henry. Now, Henry became obsessed with having a male heir. Now, in today's sort of standards, it doesn't really matter if it's a, a girl or a boy. And for example, um, Prince William and um, Kate, they said before they had their first child, they said if it was a, a female child, then she would inherit the throne, which yeah. I think was the first time in history that that has ever been decided. I didn't know. That's interesting. Mm. But obviously back then, it was really important for um, the kingdom to be ruled by a male. Yeah. So Henry became completely obsessed with this kind of search for this male heir. So by 1527, Henry had decided to end his marriage to Catherine so that he could wed a new wife. So Henry asked the Catholic Church to invalidate his marriage because Catherine had been married to his brother. However, Catherine refused to go along with Henry's plan, swearing that her marriage to Arthur had remained unconsummated. Even after being separated from her daughter, the devout Catherine maintained that her marriage to Henry was valid and indissolvable. As her nephew was Charles V, the Holy Roman Emperor, Pope Clement VII would not accede to Henry's wishes. 
So tired of waiting, Henry decided that he did not require the Pope's approval. In 1533, Henry, who had already secretly married Anne Boleyn by this point, had Thomas Cranmer, the Archbishop of Canterbury, annul his marriage to Catherine. Parliament then declared that the king, not the Pope, was head of the Church of England. Now, it basically came from this um, sort of annulment that Henry was able to kind of um, drift away from the Pope drift away from the kind of Catholic hold on the country. And that is where the birth of Protestantism came into force. Okay, okay. So Catherine was obviously very unhappy about this and she continued to refuse and and recognise the legitimacy of Henry's actions and still considered herself to be queen, refusing to send Boleyn her crown jewels when her replacement asked for them. So she kept isolated and separated from her daughter, Mary. Catherine died at Kimbolton Castle in Huntingdonshire, Cambridgeshire, England, on January 7th, 1536, at the age of 50. This kind of moves us on to Anne Boleyn. Now, Anne Boleyn is probably one of the most famous of Henry's wives. Do you know much about Anne Boleyn? Um, a little bit, but I will wait to hear okay. more from you. So she was, a bo- she was born around 1501, and Anne Boleyn was the daughter of Sir Thomas Boleyn, who would later become Earl of Wiltshire and Ormond, and his wife, Lady Elizabeth Howard. After living in France for a time during her youth, Boleyn returned to England in 1522 and soon established a residence at King Henry VIII's court as a maid of honour to Catherine of Aragon, Henry VIII's queen consort at the time. So she basically wormed her way into the court and was the uh, maid of honour. So the queen would have basically a a group of women that would basically do anything for the queen. They would... uh, They would follow her. They would do everything that she needed to do. Um, And that was called the Queen's Consort. So by the mid-1520s, Boleyn had become one of the most admired ladies of court, attracting the attention of many men, among them Henry Percy, the sixth Earl of Northumberland. When Henry VIII caught wind of Lord Henry Percy's desire to marry with Boleyn, he ordered against it. So around this time, whether it was before or after Percy's interest in Berlin had developed is uncertain, the king himself fell madly in love with this young maid. What is known is that Boleyn's sister, Mary, one of the king's mistresses, had introduced her to Henry VIII and that the king wrote love letters to Boleyn from around 1525. So now, he's busy around that time then. Yeah, very busy. Now, um, I'm not sure if you've ever watched this film. It was... Um, the other Boleyn sister. I haven't seen it, though. No. So basically it was a film based on um, Mary Boleyn. Um, and apparently she was one of his mistresses mm. and um, had, I think it was two children of with Henry. But obviously nothing was ever confirmed about it. But she later went on to marry um, this man who had no sort of social standing um, and basically was then kind of released from court. Her sister, Anne, also decided to, you know, disown her for her for that marriage, which is interesting. Brutal. But that would already put... So that already puts Henry's child count at nine. Yeah. For someone that didn't have a male heir, he was really racking up the child count. <laughs> I know, I know. So... In one of the king's letters, he wrote, If you give yourself up, heart, body and soul to me, I will take you for my only mistress, rejecting from thought and affection all others save yourself, to serve only you. Now, Berlin replied with rejection, however, explaining that she aimed to be married and not to be a mistress. So her letter back to him stated, Your wife I cannot be both in respect of mine own worthiness and also because you have a queen already. Your mistress I will not be. Now, how do you think Henry took that? Oh, I'm sure he just, he was really happy and he just (laughs) carried on with his day, probably had some meat, had a jousting fight and then went to bed. Not quite. Okay, so think about it. The most powerful man in England. And remember, at that point, England had um, a lot of sway over different countries as well. He was not best pleased. Um, So Boleyn's response surprised him. Um, who was believed to have had several mistresses at that time and reportedly entering into these adulterous relationships because he badly wanted a son and Catherine of Aragon had not born a male child. 
So, Henry was desperate to have Berlin. So he quickly configured a way to officially abandon his marriage with Catherine. In his petition for annulment to the Pope, he cited an excerpt from the book of Leviticus, stating that a man who takes his brother's wife shall remain childless, and claimed that he and Catherine, who was his brother's widow, would never have a son who survived infancy because their marriage was a condemnation in the eyes of God. Uh, it just sounds like weaving your way out of a uh, situation you don't want to be in, doesn't it? It's also a little bit frustrating that, you know, women were not considered <laughs> children, apparently, um, because he did have kids with Catherine. He had six. And yet, you know, only one survived, mm -hmm. Mary, but he didn't consider her his heir at that point. So, following a six-week six years, sorry, debate, during which time Henry and Boleyn had courted discreetly and discovered that she was pregnant in early 1533. Without the blessing of the Pope, on January the 25th, 1533, Henry and Boleyn quickly married in a secret ceremony led by Thomas Cranmer, Archbishop of Canterbury. The following June, a lavish coronation ceremony was held in honour of the new Queen, on September the 7th, 1533, Queen Anne gave birth to a daughter, Elizabeth I, who would be Henry VIII's only child with Boleyn to survive infancy. Anne would conceive twice more in 1534 and 1536, with each delivery producing a stillborn baby. In 1534, Archbishop Cramner decreed Henry's marriage to Catherine Aragon invalid because she was the king's sister-in-law. Henry subsequently broke England away from Rome by setting up the Church of England. Catherine would pass away two years later in 1536. There is a lot going on there. And once again, more unfortunate tragedies with children. Exactly. And, you know, even though he remarried, he still only had a daughter from Anne Boleyn. Dominant female genes. Exactly. So that kind of leads us on to Jane Seymour. Now... The early life and background of Jane Seymour, she was born around 1509 in England and um, she was the daughter of Sir John Seymour and Margaret Wentworth. So she was born to a wealthy family and Seymour was a descendant of Edward III and offered quite a bit of, as a member of such a prestigious family, including more than 100 manors in 19 countries and five castles. That's an absurd amount. To even have one manor these days is considered just diving above what anyone would consider opulent and that's just insane uh, yeah i mean what a catch really he was probably thinking money so th train yeah <laughs> the young woman wasn't well educated only knowing how to read and write her own name she was proficient in household tasks and other hobbies such as gardening and needlework so I think we've touched on this before. Women back in the day weren't really considered worthy enough to have a full education. And this kind of, you know, smacks of that. You know, she, she wasn't very well read. She couldn't really write anything other than her name. But she was very good at gardening and needlework. Hmm. So Seymour acted as a lady-in-waiting or maid of honour for King Henry VIII's first wife, Catherine of Aragon. And a second, Anne Boleyn, in 1529 and 1535, respectively. So what we have in common with all of these women is that they were all part of the English court and they all served um, under the, you know, Henry's wife at the time. So he was just picking and choosing, it felt like, the women that were surrounding his current wife. Well, he, he clearly feels like he's above the law. So I guess, yeah, it's just, he, he like you said, he is literally just saying, I want you, I want you, and now I want you, and, and there's nothing anyone can do about it. Mm. So in September of the year that Henry VIII married Boleyn, he visited the Seymour home. It's believed that Jane Seymour caught his eye during the visit, and in February of the following year, rumours of his attraction to Seymour began to spread. This was also a short time after Boleyn's second miscarriage. Aside from her beauty and status, Seymour's timid and reserved nature is thought to be attracted the king to her, a stark contrast to his previous two wives. Now, obviously, um, Catherine of Aragon, she was, you know, I guess headstrong. She refused to acknowledge what Henry was doing. She refused to accept that she was no longer queen. And Anne Boleyn was kind of a force to be reckoned with. So poor old 
Jane Seymour, very timid, very shy. I think it was a, a refreshing sort of start for the king. Yeah, definitely different. So after having incited controversy for divorcing his first wife, Henry VIII had Boleyn executed on May the 19th, 1536, and privately married Seymour 11 days later. Unlike her predecessors, Seymour never underwent a coronation, thus was never officially crowned queen. It has been argued that Henry VIII was waiting for Seymour to deliver the son he desired so desperately, but that hasn't actually been proven. So in May 1537, it was announced that Seymour was pregnant. She gave birth on October the 12th, 1537, to the heir that Henry VIII had wanted years to had waited years to produce. Young Edward VI was born at Hampton Court Palace. As was the custom at the time, Jane Seymour did not attend her son's christening on October the 15th, but waited in her chambers until the elaborate ceremony was over when Prince Edward was returned to her. Seymour died only nine days later of perpetual fever, an infection that can occur post-childbirth. She was buried at Windsor Castle in St George's Chapel. So think, he's waited almost his whole life for this, you know, male heir, finally gets one, and the woman that, you know, gave him that child dies nine days later. It's a horrid, horrid way to go. As the mother of his heir, Henry VIII took the death of his wife extremely hard. Not only did he reportedly wear black for months after her death, but he also waited until 1540 to remarry. Of the king's six wives, Seymour was the only spouse buried with him in the same tomb after his death. Interesting. So it's almost like she was the only one that he really loved. Yeah. Or cared for. Isn't, yeah, because I, I guess the rest of them didn't have such a fun time, is probably the best way to say it. Fun time. No, one of them was beheaded. The other was told she was no longer queen after a long time of being queen. And this one died. It's not looking good. No, it's a, it's a, it's a weird time in history. <laughs> So this next wife, um, this is a really interesting one and often gets overlooked because obviously the most famous are Catherine of Aragon and um, Anne Boleyn. So the next one, the fourth wife, was called Anne of Cleves. Now, Henry VIII chose his fourth wife from her portrait, so it was almost like a male order bride. <laughs> yeah, I guess so, yeah. <laughs> He was disappointed by the real woman, but there is more to his change of heart than first appears. So why did Henry marry Anne? Basically, he couldn't get out of it. An alliance with the House of Cleves was a move intended to bring Henry the political support and power that he craved in Europe. He also needed a spare to his heir, Prince Edward. So by the time Anne arrived in England, the original politician reason for political reason for the union had diminished and the lack of any immediate chemistry between Henry and Anne didn't really help. Anne and Henry were also separated by language, culture and personality. They had not met before their betrothal. So literally it that is, is yeah, an arranged marriage. Yeah. A, a male, male order bride. Yeah. <laughs> like what you see, click here. <laughs> <laughs> So Henry, who liked to choose his brides for himself, normally from the ranks of ladies and waiting at court, may have already set his sights on Catherine Howard as his next wife. Desperate attempts to halt the Cleves wedding failed, much to the king's fury. So the most embarrassing moment of all of this. So while on her way to London, Anne was surprised by a group of masked men led by a tall, burly, middle-aged man who tried to kiss her. Anne, unused to such behaviour, pushed him away in bewilderment. In her embarrassment, she had rejected Henry himself, who was not impressed by her lack of sophistication. So the chivalric tradition of meeting your betrothed in disguise was meant to demonstrate true love, as the bride-to-be would see through the disguise and recognise her beloved. It was not a great start. Even though they've never... Uh, there's so many things wrong with that. There's so many... Uh, it's just terrible. Exactly. So, despite Thomas Cromwell trying to find ways for Henry to send Anne back, the marriage still went ahead. The wedding night, however, was what can only be described as a disaster. 
So Anne's innocence and Henry's impatience, combined with his apparently intermittent impotence, meant the marriage was not consummated. So Henry persisted for four nights before blaming Anne's unattractive physical appearance for his failure to do his duty. The marriage was annulled after six months. That was a train crash, wasn't it? Well, for a king that has, you know, come across in history as this kind of manly, burly man, he wasn't able to consummate the marriage, which is, uh, you know, disappointing. (laughs) So was it a happy ending? I know you're all after the, the question, the answer to that. The juicy bits. The juicy bits. So because Anne didn't make a fuss about the marriage being annulled, she and the king remained on good terms. She was rewarded for her acquiescence with a generous allowance and property in Kent. So Anne was even invited to Hampton Court for Christmas, where on one occasion she danced with the new queen, Catherine Howard. She was also given 4,000 British pounds a year to stay in England. That's a lot of money back then. Think about that. That's a ridiculous amount of money Hmm. and actually i think she was pretty happy not to be executed yeah i would be as well (laughs) so catherine howard so catherine howard was reportedly young pretty and full of life so by the time she met henry um he was middle-aged plagued by old sporting injuries and had developed a terrible habit for turning on his wives when they did not meet his lofty expectations It was probably fair to say that this match was probably doomed from the start. So why did Henry VIII marry Catherine Howard? So after the speedy collapse of his unsuccessful match to Anne of Cleves, Henry was determined to choose his next bride for himself. So his attention was soon drawn to Catherine Howard, who was a cousin of Anne Boleyn, keep it in the family, who was a lady-in-waiting to Henry's former wife, Anne of Cleves. She was reportedly beautiful and full of life and much younger than her mistress. After the speedy collapse of his unsuccessful match to Anne of Cleves, Henry was determined to choose his next bride for himself. So the young Catherine was pushed by her family into the king's attention, who decided she was exactly the sort of wife he had been looking for. However, many have suggested that they were poorly matched, not least because of the 30 or so year age gap between them. Yeah, it's too much. 30 years. Too long. Anyway, Henry and Catherine were married on the 28th of July, 1540, just three weeks after his marriage to Anne of Cleves was annulled. Catherine faced many challenges as a young bride, including the fact that she was at least two years younger than Henry's elder daughter, Mary. Unsurprisingly, she found the role of stepmother extremely difficult. However, a more serious issue was also to emerge. Henry expected high moral standards in his wives, quite unlike his own, and it was rumoured that Catherine had an ambiguous sexual past. This would not come to the king's attention until it was tragically late. So Catherine's past has been the subject of much research and speculation. In likelihood, several details were hidden from the king, which would later prove fatal for Catherine. Catherine's mother died when she was young. She was sent to live with her step-grandmother, Agnes Howard, the Dowager Duchess of Norfolk. Evidence suggests that she was not as protective of her charge as she would have been, which turned out to be a terrible mistake. So in the years before coming to court, Catherine was reportedly subject to the advances of her music teacher, Henry Mannix, who was more than twice her age. What's more, Catherine and her friends entertained male admirers unsupervised. Catherine was later said to have had a sexual relationship with a young nobleman called Francis Derriman between 1537 and 1539. This was an age where gossip was rife and an upper-class girl's virginity was considered an important asset to be protected until marriage. A reputation could be ruined by rumoured allegations and destroy a young girl's prospects. Another busy childhood. (laughs) Well, she just seems a little bit kind of, you know, loose in the word for her age. Anyway, Hmm. so... Henry was seemingly unaware of Catherine's past, which by his standards would cast her as immoral and unworthy of his hand in marriage. Tragically, her chances of keeping it a secret were dashed when she made the mistake of having an affair with Thomas Culpepper, a gentleman of the King's Privy Chamber. 
We know very few details about this alleged affair, but reportedly her maid, Jane Bullen, Lady Rochford, helped Catherine meet with Thomas in secret while Henry was away from court. Rumours of Catherine's affair reached the Archbishop of Canterbury. Further investigations into Catherine's past quickly followed, and the king was informed of Catherine's pre-marital behaviour and alleged infidelities at Hampton Court Palace on the 2nd of November, 1541. It's thought that the archbishop left a letter in the king's pew in the chapel royal. Catherine was charged with leading an abominable, base, carnal, voluptuous and vicious life like a common harlot with diverse persons. Sir Henry was reluctant at first to believe anything and passed the allegations off as rumour and gossip. Catherine's former lovers were arrested and tortured, with Derham confessing to a sexual relationship. It seems that Henry may have been willing to forgive Catherine for her past before their marriage, but the case of an affair proved too much. When Culpepper II admitted to his clandestine meetings with the Queen, Henry's rage swept away all thoughts of mercy. So the king had left Hampton Court on the 6th of November, never to see his young wife again. Later that month, she was stripped of her title as queen. Several agonising months would pass before she would meet her violent end, during which time both Derriman and Culpepper were executed. Catherine was taken to the Tower of London on the 10th of February 1542, and on the way may have seen the rotting heads of Culpepper and Derriman, which were displayed on London Bridge. On the morning of 13th of February 1542, Catherine Howard was beheaded. Her maid, Jane Boleyn, Lady Rochford, followed her to the block. It's believed Catherine may have been as young as 17 when she died. She's way too young to be a part of that life. It's just incredible, isn't it? Imagine a 17-year-old being kind of wrapped up in all of that agony and distress and rumours and murder, pretty much. Mm. So Catherine Howard is actually buried in the chapel of St. Peter ad Vincula at the Tower of London. It's said, though, that when Catherine was arrested at Hampton Court Palace, she broke free from the guards and ran to the doors of the Chapel Royal, where she believed Henry was at prayer. She screamed to the king for mercy, but to no avail. Today, the story goes that her famous ghost can still be seen running along what is known as the Haunted Gallery at the Palace. Some visitors have reported feeling a chill or strange sensation when passing along the corridor. Do you think that's true? Mm, I'm not sure, really. Well, I mean, there's lots of, like, kind of, I guess, people stating that they see ghosts and, you know, have these supernatural encounters. But... I know that we have a lot of old historical buildings in the UK and you kind of wonder whether there are actual real hauntings of these places. And that we will cover in the future. So this takes us to the last wife, Catherine Parr. So Catherine Parr and Henry VIII met when she secured a position in Princess Mary's household in late 1542. Catherine was, by most accounts, vivacious, attractive and a scholar. She was also 30 years old, a mature contrast to Catherine Howard and a more sensible choice for an ailing king in need of a nurse as much as a wife. So why did Henry marry Catherine? So by 1543, Catherine had already been married and widowed twice, but was in love with Thomas Seymour. She gave him up to marry the king. This was much a sign of her pious adherence to what she saw as God's will, as perhaps a practical acceptance that Henry wouldn't last forever. Catherine married Henry on the 12th of July 1543 at Hampton Court Palace. A keen patron of the arts, Catherine was the first English queen to write and publish her own books. Catherine was also a loving stepmother to Henry's three children and brought unity to the family. So it seems like even, you know, through all this turmoil and anguish, the last wife, Catherine, was actually quite a nice person. Yeah, definitely seems so. So Princess Elizabeth was particularly fond of her stepmother and Catherine took custody of the 14-year-old Elizabeth after Henry's death. The Queen was also a vigorous supporter of the English Reformation. She sometimes pushed her evangelical views too far with Henry when discussing religion. Catherine's religious opponents plotted against her and tried to persuade the king that she could be dangerous. So plans were also drawn up for her arrest. 
Catherine was warned of the danger she faced and had the sense to throw herself on Henry's mercy and plead for forgiveness. Henry was completely disarmed at that point and actually forgave her. So someone that has kind of shown very violent tendencies forgave her. Yeah, I guess it was. Yeah, that's a first, isn't it? It really is for him. So Catherine remained loyal and devoted to Henry throughout their five years of marriage until his death. She was then free to marry her sweetheart, Thomas Seymour, a few months later. Soon she was delighted to be pregnant. Tragically, she contracted purpurfural fever soon after being delivered of a healthy daughter and died on the 5th of September, 1548. It's a sad end for what seemed like a genuinely nice woman. Yeah. So now to look at Henry's legacy and also his death. So Henry VIII came to love executing people. And that's kind of evident through, you know, the story of his six wives as well. He loved it so much that he had to invent new and exciting ways to do it. One of his favourite was called pressing. Have you heard of pressing? I have actually, yeah. And we it was something that we discussed in the history of the witches if you remember yeah so it involved putting a prisoner under a massive slab of wood and slowly adding weights until they were crushed alive brutal that is a it's a horrible horrible way to die henry made sure to add the weights as slowly as he could to make the whole thing as agonizing as possible <laughs> It turns out the new king could be incredibly cruel, something his many wives had to learn the hard way. So Henry VIII died at the age of 55 on January the 28th, 1547. His nine-year-old son, Edward VI, succeeded him as king, but unfortunately he died six years later. Mary I spent her five-year reign steering England back into the Catholic fold, but Elizabeth I, the longest reigning of the Tudor monarchs, re-entrenched her father's religious reforms. And that is why we still have the Church of England today. So yeah, he clearly had an influence on her. Definitely. And obviously when he, um, you know, the, the marriage was annulled between him and Catherine, it then started off this kind of chain reaction of, you know, getting away from the Pope and getting away from the Catholic religion. And that's where the dissolution of the monasteries came in as well. So basically that was where Henry would sell off parts of the church and the monasteries, which kind of littered the UK. And um, technically they were full of these, you know, very precious and expensive, um, you know, statues and materials materials that he basically sold off so that he would increase his wealth. Yeah, it's true. And you can you can also today still see the remnants of some of those buildings. And there's actually one really close to us. Um, yeah, so um, we live near um, a beautiful priory. And um, in their kind of back garden, there's this kind of exceptionally old building where it's just the outline. So it's basically just got the kind of walls. You can walk, you can walk through it. You can walk for it and it's actually quite beautiful. You can still see where the fireplace was and, and things of that nature, but it's, you know, it's very, it's very old and crumbling around itself, which is quite sad. Well, these events did almost happen 500 years ago, so. Yeah, we're kind of lucky to still have it, I guess. Yeah. So that really takes us to the end of um, Henry's life and wives. So what do you make of that? Why? Well, yeah, he had a very busy life. Very busy life. Lots of wives. <laughs> Lots of impatience. Lots of beheadings and, and torture and murder as well. Just a normal day for a king. Yeah. So what's up on the next podcast? So the next podcast is going to be on Vlad the Impaler. Vlad the Impaler. Please tell me a little bit more. So he is someone who lived many years ago. Mm-hmm. And he was famous for killing and drinking peop- and drinking his victims' blood. Now, if vampire. Pe- now, if people know or have heard of Count Dracula, yes, then he was created based on his image. Really? So when Bram Stoker created the vision of Dracula, it was based upon Vlad the Impaler's efforts, and we'll dig into that a bit further in the next episode. That's very interesting. It is, and it's definitely in the UK. It'll be a film that many people will have seen or at least know the name of, but hopefully it'll be an interesting topic for people to listen to. Excellent. Can't wait.
So, thank you so much for joining us today. Um, we all hope you have a lovely weekend. Mm -hmm. And we will see you very soon for our fifth episode. And if there is anything that you want to get in contact with us about, or there's a topic that you would like us to research, then please do contact us at uncoveringhistorypodcast at gmail.com. Brilliant. Thanks a lot. Thanks a lot, guys. Bye.